you touched on the fact that blood glucose can be a clue to whether or not we're starting to become metabolically insufficient. The challenge with that is the fact that insulin in our body, by producing more of it, overcompensates to control that blood glucose. And this comes back to that period of time we've been talking about where this can go on for up to 20 years. And if your doctor and you are only looking at blood glucose, you could be missing this. So let's talk about definitive testing. Somebody that might have some of these symptoms we've been talking about, but they want to be sure whether or not they're in this category of insulin resistance. What tests could they have done? Well, I will tell you, I wouldn't run to your doctor and do it. Uh, you can, you can say, doc, I want to check a fasting insulin. And we have lots of people do that, but the fasting insulin is still often normal for up to 10 years into this process. So we're looking at a body that still recovers well when you stop eating, you know, by definition, fasting is in the morning after you haven't had any food in your system for hopefully 10 hours. And even 12 hours is a good uh, rule of thumb in some clinics. So at 12 hours, your insulin should be normal. And most people in the first decade of metabolic disease still have a fasting insulin less than seven. And we would say, eh, that's, that's pretty normal. Uh, the second thing that happens with fasting insulin is it's best to do it before you move around. So I don't know how you're going to do that from your own bed. So, I mean, with and unless you're in your own bed, you, you would need to check it yourself before you start stirring up the endocrine system that will respond to your life. So you get up, you drive to the clinic and get your blood drawn. And in the way, you know, somebody cuts you off and it raises your cortisol level a little, Ooh, you just screwed up my laps. So again, there's a lot of variables that people take confidence in that being normal with a fasting insulin. I stopped doing it years ago because I think this way works better. I tell my patients to get a continuous or to get a glucose meter and then use glucose and ketones at the same time. And we use this because, uh, like any, um, important measurement in the human body, it's going to be, we, we want, we don't want something just at one point in time. We want, uh, a, a collection of data that collection teaches us a better, uh, has a better lens saying, how exactly are you doing? So when people wake up and uh, check their glucose first thing in the morning, I also have them check another fuel that shouldn't be zero. It should be measurable first thing in the morning. And that is a blood ketone. Um, Thankfully, about a decade ago, these became over the counter and patients can measure them you know, with their own. They can buy them without doctor's involvements. So you can measure blood ketones and blood glucose at the same time. And this is a very specific measurement uh, that predicts with high accuracy what's your insulin doing. So insulin is a, um, pro, you know, what, what is insulin's first thing it does? Uh, it's going to try to store that glucose. Insulin is an insulator. It's going to store that glucose. And when insulin is present, the ketones have to be low. Uh, you can't have high insulin and high ketones at the same time unless you're in a major metabolic dis- dysfunction called uh, ketoacidosis, which is not what most people have. Um, that's, that's what... Um, is a distraction for our discussion today, actually. So looking at glucose and ketones at the same time, um, there's uh, several scientific papers written about this. We know that um, what they're trying to measure is if I get that insulin level down and the patient is fighting cancer, we know that that stimulator of growth, insulin, the stimulator of growth is low and that the the thriving of those cancer cells that love to feed off glucose are being compromised when we lower the blood glucose and we raise the blood ketones. So this research has been ongoing for a couple of decades, but really uh, became a forefront about 2015, 2016, 2017. Uh, and we were able to see, wow, this, uh, this cancer behaved strangely in that it it was compromised. It was crippled by a metabolic state that we could see when measuring fasting glucose and fasting ketones. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll digress in just a minute because I'm, I at first asked patients to say, "I want you to go measure your glucose and measure your ketones," and we're going to work for this thing called a glucose ketone index. But 
Jesse, I should have been in Canada. <laughs> I should have been using your metrics because our American people had to take that uh, the metric of glucose and convert it to a molar measurement, which is what the rest of the world uses, uh, before we could get, put them into ratios. And I needed the gluco the ketones to be at a one, and the the glucose to then be at whatever mathematical level it was. And we were looking at that glucose ketone ratio, and so then we would take away the one and just use one number. It was very, it was easy math for anybody who likes it. But about the time I go to explain this to one of my patients whose brain is a little foggy because they've got metabolic disease. Oh, did I lose my audience? So uh, the person I explained this to first was my mother who was fighting the same cancer. And we wanted her GKI to be one. What that meant is we wanted as many glucoses and ketones uh, millimolar to be similar in her blood at the time she was fighting this really deadly cancer, a cancer that had taken her life expectancy down to six months. And we'd been through every Western approach and she refused, said, I'm not letting you do that to me again. And as we, as I, I mean, literally experimented on my mother, um, which is, it gives me goosebumps every time I do it because it was such a trust in, in my faith, in, but also in, um, and something I knew uh, we had to do something different uh, because she was right. She had become a, she was a gray 74 four year old zombie that, excuse me, she was 71, 71 year old zombie. And it was awful. So if we get to the point where we got to measure the numbers because we're trying to say that insulin needs to be down. I need this metabolic chemistry set in all of your body, for your brain, for your body, and also to deny that cancer, these high levels of glucose that you've been feeding it. And again, she wasn't terribly high, uh, an average blood, blood sugar of around 105 or 102. So not awful, but enough to keep that cancer growing. And um, when I started to explain Canadian metrics to her, <laughs> she was going to fire me. So I said, okay, mom, I want you to take the big number. That's the glucose. I want you to divide it by the little number. That's the ketones. And we're going to call this, you know, the Dr. Boz ratio. Actually, I didn't call it that. I just said, we're going to call it dirty math. And <laughs> we will just use this number because I know you can do it. And um, that was when the Dr. Boz ratio was born. It has since not been, um, uh, has been adopted by, you know, even Keto Mojo inside their system has, uh, has a metric that says you can use <laughs> the dirty math right with us. <laughs> Uh, because it is simplified. And when we look at that, um, Dr. Bao's ratio, it truly does predict health uh, in that you can touch a, a workout for your metabolism better um, by measuring this than anything else I check long-term. I can tell you what I geek out on and what I'd love to know about my patients, but it spends a few hundred dollars of their money. And I contend it removes the ownership that their um, their brain and body uh, are doing with um, when it comes to uh, it removes the ownership of their ability to uh, to be responsible and and really take ownership of what is your number and what are you doing to make it better or worse. And I find that's one of the biggest displacements in medicine is when patients come to get you know labs done or get information that they kind of hand you a platter with their life on it saying, hey, can you just tell me what to do? And they step back from really engaging uh, and being you know, more, more onerous, more responsible for their, um, their outcomes. So I, I really like how this does that. I, I do have some slides if you wanted me to try to teach that a little better. It might be a little confusing for people to see what do I think blood glucoses and ketones teach. And Yeah, well, before um, you get into that, just to summarize what you just shared, most practitioners in our space are a big fan of the fasting insulin. You mentioned that you'd prefer to use this method. There's also home IR and the craft test, and those would be the top three tests that people in our world would typically use, you're saying even better. And again, this comes back to insulin resistance. If somebody wants to see if they're on that continuum, taking a test to see your blood glucose and your ketones in your mind trumps, trumps those other tests. Absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll just, let's just back up a little to you know, home IR is looking at how, how insulin resistant are you? But as you look at 
um, the variability of that test, you're using one point in time. And people hold on to these numbers and say, but this is what my number is. And if the number was a little high, if the number was a little low, and that and these these are very variable. I mean, I'll show you a slide here in a minute that says the difference between an hour in when you test and you know getting ticked off. <laughs> I mean, the emotions do change how blood glucose your body responds. That's that's healthy. That's what we want you to do. Um, you know, the other one that you mentioned is the um, the craft test, which is a wonderful test. But have you ever done one? No, I've heard about it though. You have to. It's lengthy and you got to sip on this glucose solution and it sounds painful. Well, and the, the hardest, guess what the price is here in America for one of those craft tests? I'll say 600 Yeah, $2,500. Wow. Plus you're, and the reason why you're drinking glucose, which is something people in our world wouldn't want to expose themselves to, especially if they're metabolically unhealthy. Right. Well, even if you said, okay, I'm going to trade it out for a Snickers bar or something, I'm going to measure my, my, you know, some clinics will say I, I do a craft test using something that they're more likely to be eating. Uh, okay, fine. So I think you're measuring the, the fairy land there. I think, you know, have them eat a Snickers bar, standardize it, but um, it, because they wouldn't, there, there's a chance they might eat a Snickers bar or something that's in that realm. Uh, even a, you know, a quote, healthy protein bar that's, you know, got, um, substitute fiber in it or something. It just, w when I look at insulin resistant patients and what their blood sugars do in response to some of those foods, it's very telling. It's just the burden of the cost is also like, oh, that's, that's really ridiculous. Um, and, and I don't get $2,500 worth of data out of one check. Um, so to me, <laughs> I would rather you spend $2,500 for a lifetime supply of blood glucose and blood ketone strips and, and then sync them up to a graph and we can look at them together because you, not only are you able to say, oh, on that day, it was right after my sister-in-law's birthday party and she makes the greatest this and puts tequila in it. And, you know, like th there's life involved with these tests. And when the patient says, wow, look what that did. Now I'm engaging them in a, a short feedback loop that we can, we can hone in a, on a behavior change because that's what inherently is the key to success for people getting out of a metabolic disorder and into a healthy one is the behaviors they've acquired. And many of them were taught out of the loving, baking prairie women that were in my ancestry too, but they are, they should, <laughs> that, that turned into pathology. Somewhere along the line, you have grown a major disease from that, um, that behavior. And to say no to something that seems so common and so comforting and is so rooted to your identity, oh, good grief. We have to, we have, to have a feedback loop that you're seeing uh, an accountability partner, if nothing else. And, and I do contend that a glucose ketone meter will get you, it, it speaks truth, that's for sure, Jesse. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. If I had to put one demon out there for the chronic diseases that have filled my internal medicine clinic for 20 years, insulin wins. You can say, Doc, I want to check a fasting insulin. And we have lots of people do that. But the fasting insulin is...